e mihi mahana kia koutou katoa, uh, ngā manu hiri kua taimai nei, uh, ko Kim Hamilton taku ingoa, he kaiputahi mō Community Research. Um, I'm absolutely privileged today to be um, presenting a webinar with uh, Dr Marewa Glover, who is a director and Indigenous behavioural scientist who's worked on reducing harms from smoking for over 25 years. She's been involved in numerous scientific publications, has developed amazing initiatives and led many research projects. Um, one of her passions is reducing smoking amongst Māori and in particular pregnant Māori women. And she's been involved in it also in work uh, reducing obesity. Prior to establishing the Centre of Research Excellence on Indigenous Sovereignty and Smoking last year, um, Marewa was a professor in public health at Massey University and the chair of End Smoking New Zealand, a non-government organisation that's advocated for harm reduction and reducing smoking. Um, Marewa has also been a finalist in the New Zealand Women of Influence Awards in 2017. Um, she's been a tireless uh, public health commentator and advocate and last year, um, actually, sorry, this year, she was also a finalist, one of three for New Zealander of the Year. In 2018, she was honoured with the International Network of Nicotine Consumers Association's Outstanding Advocate Award for her work in promoting vaping as an accepted risk alternative to smoking in New Zealand. The Centre of Research Excellence has some pretty audacious goals. Uh, they include building Indigenous peoples' capacity to respond to, reduce and reduce the harms caused by tobacco smoking, to advance knowledge on Indigenous tobacco use and how to more rapidly reduce the number of, Māori, of, of people using tobacco in a harmful way, and advance the knowledge on theory, addiction, behavioural change and harm reduction by adding Indigenous perspectives. Um, yeah, so uh, welcome, Marewa, uh, Dr. Glover. Um, absolutely thrilled. I know uh, you've got a touch of the flu as has been going around a little bit. So really appreciate you making time today um, to speak to everybody. Um, yeah, I'd like to really o uh, open the chance for you to kind of um, have a present, um, do your presentation or have a bit of a discussion. In particular, uh, I was interested and part of the reason why we approached you to present was um, the work that you've recently commissioned around uh, Māori taxes and treaty settlements and some of the comparative analysis around uh, Māori taxes and benefits. So um, over to you, Mariwa. Oh, kia ora koutou and uh, tēnā koe. Um, kia ora mō tō pānui ki au. Uh, kua tahi. Ko nga tuki matafaurua te waka, ko hoki anga te awa, ko nga pui nui tonu tiwi. Um, I'm obviously a Marewa Glover, and uh, ko kuk rawa, ko baker nga ingoa whānau no hoki anga. So, uh, yes, I, I hear everyone has got the flu. It's uh, And we even have flu shots, so I don't know what's happening there. <laughs> so, um, but I'm on the mend. So. Much appreciated. So you want me, um, so, sorry, I've sent through my PowerPoint, so I'm not sure if you got them just then. But, yeah, the the purpose of commissioning that research, which um, hopefully you've got the link and everyone can get a copy of, was really to just get the information and get the information out to our leaders. So one of the things that I have been noticing through my research with uh, particularly pregnant Māori women and Māori smokers over the, was the last decade is that the, uh, the price of tobacco keeps going up and up and up. Now, when I first started in public health, I was told that this is the most effective way to get people to stop smoking. And certainly smoking has come down over the last 35 years. I've been in this now for 27 years. And smoking, stop smoking campaign started in about 1985. There was a big national um, campaign to get New Zealanders to stop smoking. And there was nothing really for Māori that was dedicated and targeted at Māori until maybe about 20 years later. But certainly smoking has been coming down across the whole population, um, Pākehā and, and Māori mainly. Pacific Island smoking has, has, has remained fairly stagnant um, across that time. So, but 
the inequity between Pākehā smoking rates and Māori smoking rates has, so it just keeps going like that, this inequity is not closing, and if anything, it's starting to widen. So my understanding of smoking, and it's my area of specialty, I did my PhD on Māori Stop Smoking, um, on the Noho Marae program actually, but People smoke to cope with life, to cope with stress and everything that's going on in their lives. Uh, One of the biggest relapses, triggers of relapse, is negative affect, negative emotion, stress. You know, you have an argument with somebody, you have a car crash. um, And what I found, and also across with the childhood obesity work and focus groups with Māori parents, um, particularly lower socioeconomic, was that there was a lot of financial stress. And there's always been financial stress, but but I do feel like maybe it's getting worse. Um, and the other thing is that it is eating into what the amount of money that people have um, to buy food. So this is why I've supplied you with the other paper, which looks at food provisioning decisions. So how do parents decide what they're going to feed their kids? And that was really interesting And it's really interesting crossing over from like knowing all about smoking and how that impacts on people. And then look at the Fano decisions around feeding their kids. So childhood obesity has become a big thing and a big focus for public health. But among Māori, it's not, it came through in the focus groups, that's not really a high priority. It's not how Māori would frame it for a start, um, focusing in on the size of a person. And the other thing is that um, parents, especially if money is tight, they go through this complex calculation. They have to work out how many people have I got to feed? How many times do I need to feed them today? How much food do I need for each person? oh, and then that one doesn't eat this and that one won't eat that. Um, and, and there's not going to, if I if I try something new, if I experiment and they don't like it, there's not going to be any seconds. So I can't afford to do that. Um, then there's like, you know, where, where can they get the food from? Um, obviously closer to home is going to cost less than driving right across town, um, the price of food. And, there are so many factors and then stress comes into it. You know, if you worked a hard day and you get home and you still got to cook food for everybody and nobody's helping and there's no childcare and you really just want to spend some quality time with your kids because you miss them. Um, you know, and there's so many factors involved. I could really understand why at the end of the day, even though they might've had money to, to buy you know, some healthier food, they end up buying takeaways and let's just do fish and chips tonight, hey, kids? Yeah. And everyone's happy and there's no dishes. And so I I really kind of liked how it was a really solid practical example of how stress is impacting on families, how financial strain, not having enough income, especially to buy the healthier fruit and vegetables, uh, which we're told are cheaper. You know, if you, it is cheaper, it's cheaper than takeaways. No, it isn't because there's all these other factors, the convenience and the cost of going to get the food. And so it's, it's all related, which is what we've already always said. You, you can't reduce, uh, down to these one issues you know people's lives are complex and you must maintain this holistic way of looking at people's lives and all of the different factors not just look at smoking not just look at obesity or you know overweight not just look at uh, lack of exercise so a far more holistic approach so the the tobacco tax um, the price increases on tobacco And that has been done. Initially, it was done to um, persuade people to stop smoking. You know, if we hit them in the pocket, if we hurt them financially, they will quit. They will quit. And eventually, you know, I had to go, well, they're not quitting. Hang on. They're not quitting. 
And, oh, my gosh, look look at young Māori women, 18 to 24, 45% are still smoking. This is decades later, okay? We're yeah. talking, um, well, these tax increases have been going on for a decade now, and we had tax increases before. Um, people might be interested to know that actually under Labour government last time, uh, nine-year term before National got in and did a nine-year term. Last time National Labour was in, they didn't do. They they stopped the tax increases, and there was no tax increase for nine years. Um, this time, I thought, oh, Labour's back in. Um, New Zealand first. They didn't like the tobacco taxes. Winston's never liked the tobacco taxes. Mm -hmm. Thought, okay, so will they stall the tobacco taxes? They. They did last time. They know yeah. it hurts people. They know it's regressive. It hurt, which means it hurts people. Um, <clears throat> no, they haven't. And uh, Winston Peters actually said last year in a media release, if we if we stop the tobacco tax increases, we're not going to have um, we're not, we're not going to have as much money to do the things that we want to do. Uh, hang on a minute. It was about reducing death and disease. It's, it's about reducing harm, um, we're now really into another realm. So I think that, you know, when you're saving to buy something, sorry, should have turned the volume off. When you're saving to buy something, you look around like, well, okay, what can I cut back on? Saving to buy a house or saving to buy a car, you go, okay, I'll do without my daily latte. Um, we could cut back, we'll just have mints on toast for a while, you know, not do the steak or whatever. So there's kind of basic budgeting skills that everybody has. And a report came out earlier this year that looked at iwi assets. And there was a there was also a media article about the growing Māori middle class. So we we have you know we have a lot of Māori now who are doing okay you know their income's okay and they're getting to buy a house and and that's great but we still are overrepresented we have a whole lot of our people overrepresented among the lower socioeconomic and and the poorest groups in New Zealand so this growing middle class and iwi iwi and they've got the treaty settlements and then iwi uh, are buying assets that that's what businesses do. That's what iwi need to do. Build up our assets, buy land, build, you know, create businesses that are going to earn profit, plough it back in, buy the land back, um, build up your asset base. Well, it just seems simple that if you want to build up your asset base, just like everyone at home, you want to buy a house, you're going to look at your budget and you go, okay, we've got to save. We've got to save a deposit. Where can we cut back? Uh, and it was pointed out to me several years ago by um, Associate Professor Manuka Henari at University of Auckland, actually. He was like, it would be really good to know how much mm. Māori are spending on alcohol, gambling and, al and, and tobacco. Because even at that time, this is, you know, several years ago, there was the sense that that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. We've got a big hole in the bucket where we've got – all our iwi trying to, as I said, build assets. And, okay, that's iwi money. That's not Māori personally, but we're connected, right? Iwi are spending money on, on supporting their people, you know, whether they're providing life insurance for free or, or um, you know, helping their health services or whatever services, housing, papakainga. So it's all connected. If Māori individually and as families are lifted up financially, uh, then then iwi would, you know, potentially be able to put more of that investment into businesses and you know forestry, fisheries, you know, things that are going to build our overall asset bases. Iwi as hapu as whānau. So, how big is the hole in the bucket? What are Māori spending their money on? Where could we cut back, for instance? And I just wanted to quantify that, get that quantified, how much it is. And I must say it was to, to just see it in blue and white as it is in the report. Um, it was pretty sad, actually, how much money is being 
you know, drawn off. Now, I think it's important to, it's not, because there's two ways people can go, oh, well, they shouldn't spend their money on those things, you know, tobacco, alcohol, and gambling. But what I want people to look at is how much the, the government is taking in taxes. So these consumptions are considered, sin, these are sin taxes. So these consumptions are frowned upon um, sometimes. I mean, how many people in New Zealand go and buy a lotto ticket? Is that sinful? Is that bad? I mean, so many people buy lotto tickets. Rich people buy lotto tickets. Middle class buy lotto tickets. White people buy lotto tickets. Um, it's, but smoking, oh yeah, that one's bad. And if you look at the proportion of tax being drawn off people who smoke, it's now just, it's the highest in the world relative to income. Wow. Yeah, it's it's absolutely extreme. It's way beyond anything that any evidence um, knew about. We're kind of into social experiment stage here in New Zealand now and Australia in terms of how high can you go. Basic economics said it'll get to a certain point and, and demand will drop off. People won't keep paying that much. I'm sorry, they are because we're dealing with um, a product that is dependency forming. People become reliant on it chemically and, you know, socially and emotionally. Um, it's not it's not like buying soap. You know, you can buy a different soap. It's um, so we're now into a different realm with using tax um, to change behavior. One, some people are not, they're not responding that way. Certainly a whole lot of people have quit and they will say, oh, it's the price. It's not just the price. It's a whole lot of things. It's socially unacceptable now. Um, landlords discriminate against you if you smoke. Employers discriminate against you if you smoke. You know, um, town squares, you can't go there, you know, if you're smoking. It's getting really, really extreme. Um, the, the smoker bashing and exclusion and discrimination that's um, being leveled against people who smoke. I mean, even being abused in public, um, and, you know, if you smoke, you're dragged out by security or things like that is starting to happen to people around the world and in nations like New Zealand, Australia, um, that have very extreme tobacco control measures. My main concern is how it's hurting our uh, young mums, 18 to 24 year olds, for example, um, and already financially strained, a lot of them, and then, um, you know, they're using smoking to cope. People will use something. If, if people have emotional difficulties, if they have um, relationship difficulties, they have stress and strain in their lives, things aren't going that great. Lots of people, I mean, even middle class and even rich people use substances to cope with negative emotion. If they're richer, they might use something that costs a lot more. Um, people use alcohol, you know, to deal with stress. And we need to see these substances. Um, they're substances people use to serve a function. And in Māori um, health and in Māori tobacco control, well, we used to understand this. We used to, you know, there used to be compassion and understanding that people smoked for a reason and because they had stress in their lives, let's say. But the, that kind of compassion and understanding has gone out of the sector, I think, largely. Um, and and we're now into, a, into, we're moving into a realm or an era, uh, I hope it doesn't last very long, of policing public health and punishing. So that's where the taxes, um, these very excessive taxes come in and also the now looking at um, Associate Minister Jenny Celesa has announced she's going to ban smoking in vehicles, smoking, vaping, and the use of smokeless products in vehicles with an under 18 year old present, and people will be fined uh, $50. Um, 
you know, we've never fined people in New Zealand. I don't believe that, you know, 20 years ago, the Māori sector that was around then would ever have agreed to that. Um, they didn't even agree to taxes. So, uh, but that kind of afi um, and, you know, compassion and aroha has gone. Um, and, and that's partly, you know, because we have had 35 years of anti-smoking, anti-smoker um, campaigning. Everyone is programmed now just to, you know, hate the smoker. They're, you know. So the taxes are very important if we have a look at that. And um, have you got my slides, you guys? I did, I'm sorry, I sent them through quite late. Sorry, no, they haven't come through, Marewa. Uh, all right. But um, in the report, the... Uh, yep, so, sorry, I've just got to get that back up. It's okay. Um, I, one, of the, one of the quotes that's kind of springing to mind at the moment in respect of um, what you're talking about is a quote from Marshall Gantz who says, to look at disparity without an equity lens looks at broken people, not a broken system. And I think one of the things um, that's interesting in terms of where your research is trying to place an argument is really trying to get an understanding of when that threshold leaves public good and kind of moves into more, um, you know, obviously creating more harm and more more stress on families. And um, so it's, it's very timely and it was interesting listening this morning, it seems like Yep, smoking taxes are definitely going through. And I saw Winston's um, Winston's <laughs> quote in there. I'm I'm really interested in how you think this whole the 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 methodology and the research might be used as a tool for advocacy, and also about how you know using this sort of information um, kind of pushes into other areas of debate, public debate. Okay. Uh, what sort of advocacy, Kim? Um, I guess in terms of advocating for, I guess, some, some change in compassion in terms of the policy decisions that government's making. I guess one of the points that I'm taking away from what you're talking about is that we've, we've kind of passed the threshold where tax is going to make a difference on people's behaviour and it's actually creating more harm than good and that we need to look at other ways of addressing, you know, the disproportionate levels of Indigenous smoke or Māori smoking in this country. Yeah. And we need to, you know, as an ex-smoker myself and somebody who kind of took up iron Māori and, um, you know, I think there's, it is complex, you know, I'm pretty well educated. <laughs> and But, it, you know, it became a financial barrier, but there were a lot of other pushes as well. And, you know, we want our people to be healthy. And I think part of it is, you know, looking at uh, public health through an Indigenous perspective is really important, but also being able to speak to people in policy and government to inform and advocate for different ways of thinking about things. I guess I'm interested in kind of what the next steps are. Yes, yeah, so that was one of the purposes of just getting the information, um, quantifying how much is being taken off Māori via the tax on tobacco, gambling and alcohol. Um, and giving, you know, getting that information out there to um, iwi leaders, um, Māori health providers. These organisations have to lobby for funding, everyone lobbying for an improvement in, in the Māori health system. So we've just had the Waitangi Tribunal decision, and that's really great. I mean, we all knew that the system was not working uh, equitably for Māori. Um, and the tobacco taxes is, is just looking at the tax on tobacco is one of those very real examples of where the system is not working equitably for Māori. So Māori, we, yes, we have higher smoking rates. Um, what you need to look at is proportionately are Māori paying the same? So if you look at the taxes on the alcohol and the gambling, and there you see in the alcohol statistics that Māori, uh, Māori and Pākehā uh, rates of drinking alcohol is about the same. And gambling, you know, it's about the same. So proportionately, uh, the same, roughly the, the tax is equitable across the community, Māori and Pākehā. But 
because we had historically high smoking rates, the smoking rates are high because of colonization, because tobacco was introduced to our people, to both our women and men, 180 plus years ago. So there's a historical cause of the very high smoking rates. It's linked to the colonization and what the settlers did um, in introducing tobacco and alcohol to Māori to, you know, to grease the wheels of trade and land exchange and the extraction of land and resources from Māori at that time. So there's a historical cause um, over the last 35 years, we could have done a lot more to reduce that inequity. I think that should have been the priority, reduce the inequity so we have equal smoking rates then bring us down together. That is not what governments and have chosen to do. And that is largely because they are, um, those systems, uh, the Ministry of Health and all of the ministries are dominated by the non-Māori um, staff who work in there, non-Māori medical staff, primarily in the medical, in Ministry of Health and policy analysts. So having been a policy anal analyst in that system, th there's very few Māori and it's very, very difficult for Māori voices to be heard. And we're just over, you know, we're just overpowered um, by the majority view. So, um, <sighs> That, that Waitangi Tribunal decision was was really great for us. Um, whether or not we will start to get a voice and we will start to be listened to, I don't know. Um, and yeah, so how can you use this for advocacy? Well, well, one thing is that the Māori health providers, Māori health advocates within, you know, within the system, here is a solid example of, of where a huge inequity is incur occurring. It is not a fair tax when, and neither is the ban on smoking in vehicles, for example, because Māori have disproportionately high smoking rates. Māori women have disproportionately high smoking rates. Oh, Māori mothers, therefore. And who's driving around with kids in the car? mothers and uh, so the ban on smoking in vehicles as an example of a racist law um, this is going to disproportionately it's targeting really a group who have a disproportionately high rate of smoking that isn't fair it is not one law for all and that's just another example of policies and um, programs or even laws that are made that will have a greater harmful impact on Māori. It's all about keeping Māori oppressed and stuck in a state of poverty. Um, you know, a $50 fine doesn't sound very much, but what if you can't pay it? And nobody who was surveyed and asked, do you support this, was told, well, if a if a mum can't pay the $50 fine, then she faces all of these other actions. And there's a spiralling effect of oppression. Um, she could end up in court. And then if you can't pay your fines in court, you know, you could face jail time. It's, it's just horrific. Sorry, Marewe, can I just remind people that throughout this webinar, um, they're welcome to post questions to the chat feed or in our fo Facebook group. And we'll be taking some time at the end of the session also to um, answer some of those questions via the group. So, um, in, yeah, in terms of advocacy, I hope, um, well, one thing is you need information. If you're going to go and lobby for change and lobby against racist um, and discriminatory policies and decisions, lobby against uh, government policies that are harming our people, then you need information. So um, that's that's one thing. This information about how much the government's been getting um, off Māori, you know, drawing out, siphoning off um, from Māori, has, it's been there, but why isn't it put out? Why doesn't the government put it out, you know? Um, so just 
just you know one figure there if i can give you an example of how extreme this is the total tax paid by maori people who smoke just maori is 723 million um the total expenditure on cigarettes excise tax gst comes to 723 million per annum that's in, that's just from last year 2018 723 million dollars now as a comparison to trying to give it some perspective i totaled up all of the treaty settlements uh, since 1990 and from 1990 to, to 2018 the total amount paid by government in treaty settlements is 2.4 billion dollars okay 2.4 billion dollars um, so that's over nearly 30 years and in just one year of tobacco taxes the government gets two billion. So just one year of tax from everybody who smokes well and truly almost pays back what they've paid in 30 years of treaty settlements. Um, just the excise tax from Māori last year was $569 million. This is the new land grab. This is ongoing colonization, and we we have to we have to fight. But you know, in order to fight this, um, and we see the harm that's happening to our Māori all the time, and we have this taking babies off young mums uh, as as one you know incredible extreme colonizing act that um, is coming back around unbelievably but there are many many policies and decisions throughout the health system throughout the welfare system that do this um one of the things i'm really interested in because I, I read a, a publication by you some time ago um i think it was Puna Roimata. so you've you know you've done work in family violence you're doing work in, in indigenous obesity and trying to understand and come up with you know some evidence and solutions that work and you're doing the same in in um smoking so where does your passion for public health come from and what do you think we as community researchers can contribute to advancing indigenous public health you know i guess uh, progressive initiatives and funding great question uh so I ended up in public health probably by accident. I just went, you know, I, I'd been trained as a policy analyst and I wanted to um, go and get experience in government as a policy analyst. And I just ended up at the Public Health Commission when it was um, set up in 1993. And that's, I also wanted to put all of my free education um, to use for Māori and and I learned that smoking was the biggest killer and the biggest cause of disease, uh, preventable cause of disease and death among Māori. And it would not be a waste of all of that education that I'd had to try and reduce um, the disease and, you know, the premature deaths from smoking. So I started on that and um, I guess uh, – I think we could have made a lot faster progress. Um, I've certainly seen interventions that could have incredibly uh, had an incredible effect and reduced smoking rates a lot faster. But as I said, you know, Māori voices just don't um, just don't factor. You know, like we get a pilot program here and there, you get a little bit of you know money here and there to try something different but the Noho Marae program for instance that, um, that was designed by Māori for Māori in the late 1980s and it was a you know, residential program and they took people who smoked onto the Marae and um, you know basically a residential quit program and it was really it was very successful there was nothing that came along from the western world that matched those quit rates really for a long time. And then of course we had the patches and gum and the medications. And now of course, 
the there is um, new technologies and a lot of risk reduced products. I mean, just another example for in, in Sweden, and now that I'm working at a more global level and and uh, looking at other indigenous people, the Sami who are across the top of the Scandinavian countries, they they're a success story in terms of stopping smoking. They've pretty much most of them have switched to using. If, if they use any tobacco product at all, they mainly use a product uh, that Sweden has called Snus, which is um, pasteurized tobacco, powdered and in little sort of like tea bags. And they just put it up under their um, lip and the nicotine soaks in. So in some ways you could say it's a nicotine replacement product, but it's a lot stronger. So it's, it's more effective, you know, it basically they can satisfy the same level of dependency that they had when they were smoking. So that's been around for hundreds of years um, and been known about for decades. But, uh, and, and about oh, just over 10 years ago, I began to lobby, why couldn't, along with N Smoking NZ, an organization, we began to lobby for SNUS. Why couldn't smokers here have access to that? Um, nope, we, we do not have access. We weren't... <laughs> New Zealand government said no, and when I say government, really it's um, public health academics and really it's non-Māori academics that uh, stop us getting access to products like that, that we could have reduced um, the rate of disease drastically, rapidly. Um, we still, that's still a fight in the upcoming legislation that's going to go through looking at e-cigarettes um, and once and for all saying, okay, these risk reduced products are now legal um, and but we're going to regulate them and we're going to restrict um, who can buy them and where you can use them um, and I'm not sure if Swedish SNUS is going to be one of the products that gets through and I think it should. So certainly um, vaping could, I'm only going to say could here, help rapidly reduce smoking rates as it has in some other countries. Um, but that all depends on the regulations that come through. We still have a very strong group or individuals, Pākehā um, doctors and, and uh, lobbyists who are trying to undermine the efficacy of these new products and, and want to restrict them, um, are, are lobbying for banning the flavours and, you know, to make them less attractive and basically less effective. So we really have the chance to reduce Māori smoking drastically, uh, rapidly. So we can all move on to the next, you know, and to all of the other issues that we're dealing with. But um, I'm not sure we're going to get it. Um, one of the questions from uh, one of our audience is, um, you know, what are some of the other strategies instead of taxes? And um, in addition, you've just given an example from the Sami, but is there other Indigenous research um, or Indigenous initiatives worldwide that we could think about in terms of um, bringing them here to Aotearoa? Well, among the Native American, because the tobacco plant um, originated there and was especially the one that's used for smoking tobacco belongs to a Native American tribe and, and they had, uh, they, they've used tobacco for the 3,500 years. There's been a, an archaeological dig sort of dating a pipe, a smoking pipe, 3,500 years ago. So they have a very long history uh, with tobacco and relationship with tobacco. So... The, the total um, prohibition approach of tobacco control globally didn't work for the Native American tribes and their message has always been to return to a traditional way of using tobacco and and they have a, quite a few programs happening over there uh, looking at teaching um, that you know message again. So it's getting away from trying to get people away from the commercial manufactured box of cigarettes um, and back to a more traditional way of using. The other thing that's happening, and I must say, um, you know, I I was misled about um, snus. I was misled about even the dangers of chewing tobacco. I thought 
chewing tobaccos lead to like oral cancers and and you know cancers um, and all of that evidence is now being relooked at because of uh, vaping now you know now there's a range of reduced risk products but actually in fact even chewing tobacco is a lot safer than smoking tobacco and in the states a lot of people have already switched from smoking to chewing tobacco they're still told that chewing tobacco is really really dangerous and just as bad but actually in fact it's not um, so that's that kind of news when that evidence uh, starts to get round is is going to go down like a um, a cup of cold sick because um, a lot of us in tobacco control for you know the last thirty years have been told that chewing tobacco is really bad as well. Um, a harm reduction approach, which I think aligns more with a um, two to do Māori approach, is to work with where people are at. And it can it can be hard to get people to go from, you know, full on multi drug use. They drink, they smoke, they smoke dope, to prohibition, and and to just nothing the next day. And so you try to go, okay, well, wh which is the one? Let's look at where the harm is occurring, and focus on reducing the risk of harm, re reduce harm, and. And just keep working with that person. It's a, you know, as everyone says, it's a journey. So there are, I think, bringing in a harm reduction approach, which is very, very common in our drug and alcohol sector, uh, but bringing that into tobacco and working with smokers with a harm reduction, well, with, with people, with most people also drink and it's not just cigarettes often, um, but with their circumstances, and looking at well, where is harm actually occurring? If um, you know, if it's gambling, and they're starting to sort of um, sell off people's stuff and pinch people's jewelry to get money, you know, there's there's harm. So focus on reducing the harm and work backwards to, um, you know, it's a more realistic approach. I think there's a lot of um, the the tricky thing is. Is it an indigenous intervention or was it a Western program that's been imposed on an indigenous group? And in tobacco control, it can be a little bit tricky to see, you know, there might be an intervention. For example, uh, the Okati Kai Piper Stop Smoking program, which ran for about 15 years, and I was involved in, in writing the therapeutic content of that I just finished my PhD and I used what was in the evidence which were western models of um, for smoking cessation they were the gold standard at that time but that was not a Kaupapa Māori um, approach it but you know it was um, it was delivered by Kopapa Māori organisations. So that's that's fine. You can put your Māori spin on it. But what we really need to do is get to using Mātauranga Māori and Māori, um, the under, underlining theoretical framework needs to be a Māori one. Sorry, um, we've just had a, a question, I guess, about, and, and it's related, really follows on from what you've been talking about around um, the question or the comment here is the big problem with quitting smoking is based on addiction, um, which is so powerful that punishment doesn't work. So, you know, I guess part of this is what efforts and programs are there to help smokers deal with addiction? So I guess that's about what are the cope of Māori interventions in the AOD world that you think might be useful for us to consider to roll out more broadly across Aotearoa? So public health has been very compartmentalised and uh, so, you know, there's, I kind of like liken it to a railway station and you've got all your trains and there's this, there's the tobacco control train and the drug and alcohol train is, that's a different one. And you've got the obesity one and, and the, you know, not, they don't meet, they don't cross over and they don't work together. They will go off on their own track. That's um, been a failure of the Western reductionist 
way of thinking of the Western healthcare system for us. It's always been a challenge for Māori health workers um, who, you know, okay, a contract comes in, you've got to do smoking cessation. Well, you're going to visit that person and there's other issues in the household. You need to sort of, you want to address those with them as well. Um, but, you know, like it might be, oh, we've got a contract to do cervical screening or breast screening, you know, but no, no, you only go and talk about their breasts. You're not contracted to talk about their cervix and or to do the smoking. That's the other person over there. They go and do the smoking. And that, it just that just doesn't work. So the current health system or public health system, uh, and even that's a compartmentalisation, the primary care versus public health, prevention versus, you know. So we need, it's more like, you, you know, like the Fana order approach. And again, this is Māori have kept saying this, we, we don't work that way. We need to, we work with our people. We need to be able to go there and look at the issues. Where is harm occurring? What other issues are preventing them from making these healthy changes we want them to make? Um, yep. Sorry, I've... <laughs> Uh, you've got your mute. Sorry about that. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, Marima. Sorry, sorry, Fano. Um, one of the other questions we've got in here is about um, the, you know, what what do you think we can do as community researchers with the findings that you've got? What would be some of your recommendations? Because a lot of us are working in policy, we're working in communities, so. Uh, you know, is there something that you want us to take away from this? There's been there's been a big push for quite some time at a global level uh, for the healthcare system, for governments to recognise this the social and economic determinants of health. Um, so, you know, poverty is poverty is a huge barrier to health and a cause of ill health. Um, so it just makes sense that, especially with the, you know, this enormous amount of money the government is taking off Māori communities, um, especially in, you know, tobacco tax, alcohol tax and gambling tax. And that is coming off a subsection of the population who happen to be overrepresented among the lower socioeconomic. So you're taking all huge amounts, which are huge millions and millions and millions of dollars out of the Māori community, out of the lower socioeconomic Māori community. You're taking that back and then you're going to say, oh, we're going, we're going to up your benefit, give you $15 extra a week or, oh, you won't have to pay school fees, you know, for your child. Well, well that, those things they give back are a tiny fraction of what they just took. Um, so there's a huge mismatch there. I think always questioning, like, where is the evidence? Where is the evidence uh, for what you want to do? So, for example, banning smoking in cars, where is the evidence? Like, what's the point of it? they'll say, oh, it's to protect children's health. But there's no actual evidence being put up that either the children are being harmed and or that this move will, will lead to less disease in those children. Um, the evidence that's being put up is uh, some surveys that were done where you go out and, I mean, they say, do you support banning smoking cars to protect children? Oh, of course, everybody's going to say yes, but the people weren't fully informed. So you really need to look at what is being put forward as evidence at, or research. There's two different kinds. There's research where an actual research question has been answered. You're actually trying to build knowledge, like uh, what will help people stop smoking versus these advocacy research or research that's done specifically to create evidence for a lobbying position. Though that 
it's put forward as research, but so for example, these surveys, there's no research question there. It's simply the whole point of it is how many people support this. So look, everybody supports it, so you should do it. That isn't research. Uh, it tends to be highly biased as well. So we need to get smarter about saying, well, where's your evidence? Is it actually evidence or is it's created, you know, um, a heavily biased survey? And we need to be doing that sort of research ourselves. We need to be asking the research questions. We need to be setting that research agenda. And we need to be providing the sort of information that our lobbyists, our iwi leaders, our um, Māori health um, providers, that they need, arm them with that information so when they go forward, they can say, well, you need to give us more funding to address this issue, but also look at the fact that you're, you're partly creating the issue as well. And that's starting to address those social determinants of health, addressing the racism, addressing this discrimination, preventing our Māori people from, you know, getting a house um, because the landlords are discriminating. What's we've, the situation we have now is if you don't want a Māori tenant or a Māori person working in the job, you you pretty much can say, oh, well, we just we won't have any smokers. And that's going to cut out 45% of young Māori women won't be able to, won't get the job or won't get the house. Um, it's It's becoming a proxy for a particular class of people that people don't want, you know. That's an interesting comment because a lot of workplaces these days require you to be smoke free before you actually, um, they'll ask you that question when you're applying for jobs. Um, we've got a question here from somebody uh, in midwifery or nursing who's interested to know why smoke free education is no longer part or a core part of the midwifery program, do you know? And likewise, apparently it's no longer a part of the mandatory post degree professional development. I did not know that. I don't know why that would be. Um, that's concerning. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know. Um, one of the other questions I had earlier was, um, in, in this piece of research, you've commissioned it out. So when would you commission research and when would you try and do it yourself? Well, I'm not an economist, so there's no point, you know, I, I couldn't, I couldn't necessarily have done that research. So um, if you need the skills, you need a piece of research done that you, you don't have the skills to do, then obviously you're going to commission other people or hire somebody else that has, has those skills. Um, and they were very fast and, you know, very good at it. So, um Part of what I'm going to be doing is, you know, I want to build uh, Indigenous capacity as well in research. So I am I will be looking to um, support others to undertake research projects um, going forward. Have you got any concluding comments um, to make on the webinar, Marua? Um, and then we'll switch over to Facebook and people can send in questions via the chat group. Um, I think that, you know, in terms of reducing smoking and not just reducing smoking, but, you know, a number of the issues that that are a priority for, for us in the sector at the moment, you know, suicide, mental health, smoking, alcohol, uh, violence, sexual abuse. Um, I would really like to see a specific focus on um, assessing the any policy ideas or any program or intervention ideas, kind of running it through a filter of how will this work or what would the impact be for our young Māori women aged 18 to 24? Uh, they they seem, and or young men of the same age, they seem to be um, experiencing a disproportionate burden of, of, you know, the negative impacts of policies and the tax on tobacco is, is one good example. Um, and 
the yeah so in tobacco for example that and this is done a lot they'll go well we're going to prioritize youth um all youth so but yeah i just really think there needs to be a lot more um questioning and auditing before a decision is made what impact will this have on our young mums you know on young Māori women living out in Tikipunga out of Whangarei or or out in a rural area or even in urban Auckland you know this young mum who doesn't have a car and has two kids and uh what say she runs out of smokes oh, and they've banned the sale of cigarettes from dairies and petrol stations. You can only go to a tobacconist. Okay, so then instead of walking around the corner and going 10 minutes to her corner dairy, you know, there and back 10 minutes, leaving the kids in the house on their own and walking to the shop to get her smoke, she's going to have to go 20 minutes. Um, you know, so it's, it's little things. It's how does this actually impact? Our young women, um, they're the ones having it hardest at the moment, I think. Well, thank you, um, Marewa. Um, it's been, uh, you know, it's, it's, there's been a lot of food for thought in what you've talked about. There's been a lot of insight and passion, clearly, for your work. Um, I was speaking to somebody at the NASA conference recently, and they said that good research is useful research, particularly when you're working with Indigenous communities. And I would say your research is definitely up there. Um, just a couple of words to our audience. One is um, we'd like to thank those who donated when they registered for the webinar. That's very much appreciated. And if you want to be notified when we next broadcast a webinar, please subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking subscribe. Um, thank you again, uh, Dr. Glover. Um, we wish you all the best with your continued work and we hope that our audience has picked up a lot of the messages that you've left with us today in terms of thinking about privilege, thinking about power, thinking about how we can advance you know, positive responses to Indigenous and Māori communities across New Zealand and the world. So ngā mahi nui ki a koe, e oh, kia ora, kia ora koutou. Okay.